Hey, let's start the show for Thursday, August 13th, 2020. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. That's great. I, I mean, love the, that. The, Hold on. You're doubling. There you go. That was the, wonderful. <laughs> the contest is over. I mean, that, that wins, right? I, I think that's awesome. You can almost see the 1980s style, you know, Saturday morning cartoon animation that goes over it. A few things. First of all, that was created by uh, Dr. Draft on Twitter. It was not emailed to us, but I will take Twitter submissions. Uploaded SoundCloud at Less Reverb, I believe, is his handle. Jeremy, your mic is a little hot, so I'm going to let you tune that just a little bit. Uh, it was 23 seconds long, but I think that still falls within the parameters. It wasn't 30 seconds. It faded off nicely at the end. Uh, the, the 80s vibe is 100% our jam. I want to hear slightly different style just to get a sense of it but right now i agree with you it is near the top of the list that you wanna, you heavy metal a one style, a different style of music from other people yes yeah no, a yeah. different style of music for other other time periods you know like like we we of course love things that are going to tap into 80s nostalgia mm -hmm. chip tunes the you know the the stacked arpeggios of the stranger things like that stuff is great but I don't know what I'm missing unless I hear it. And if there's another style, if there's something that's a little more, maybe maybe go backward in time. What is something that's, uh, uh, what is a barbershop quartet theme sound like? Maybe that could, that could resonate with me. I don't know. I like it. Uh, that's a good, I like, I'll go for that. I just want to hear it. I, I, I get the synthesizer sounds are fantastic. Um, but there are a lot more. The longer point is that there are a lot more intros that we have to try out because you guys are killing it with sending us intros. We are still taking more of them. If you want to create one, you can just email us the SoundCloud link. We'll download it. We'll play it in a future episode or tweet it at us um, at Jer Jerware at Enchan at Science Quiche, even though Kishore's not here. It's a duo cast this week, Jeremy. How are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, thanks okay. for asking. I, I, we did just watch Strange Brew about a week ago, so it's like I, I do have a little bit of oh, okay. I'm okay. Hey, how how you doing? What, yeah, what's I'm, Strange uh, Brew? You straight seriously? The, yeah. The Bob and Doug McKenzie. Uh, they they go and they work at a beer factory. Um, you never saw this? The SCTV spinoff? No. Oh okay. No. no it's it's Is it got, an old old show. It's a comedy from the '80s. Yeah. No, you oh. absolutely have to watch it. It's it's fantastic. It made the whole family laugh. All right. Well, that's 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 what you've been doing. Watch catching up on eighties, eighties comedy. Um, here and there, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it it makes me sad to hear that you think the eighties resurgence is over and you're ready to move on to barbershop quartets. I, I but, mean, I'm ready to go back further in time. I'm 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 really into Perry Mason right now. That's my recommendation for the week. It's on HBO Max, HBO. Uh, that's the uh, the, the the noir thirties era detective lawyer. You know, courtroom drama. Uh, to revive for modern day. It's uh, Matt Reese, who uh, was in The Americans uh, and originally written and produced by uh, Robert Downey Jr. And it's just a fantastically shot show. Uh, directed many of the episodes by Tim Van Patten, who did a lot of Boardwalk Empire. So definitely, that's a very period authentic and, uh, show with a lot of great production value. Very heavy story. So it's not yeah. if you're looking for something lighter. You're a little bit too light now, Jeremy. So we're gonna oh we're gonna God. work on this. Yeah, you're you, you, so you, picky. You know what? Better to be lighter than to be too hot because I can always fix that in post. To be honest with you, what I've actually been watching every day for a few days now, which is uncommon for me, I don't watch TV, is the morning show. I'm finally watching the morning show from Apple TV Plus, which is like their big, you know, the the one that won all the awards. It's their big success story, and it's. Pretty good. I mean, have, really? have you watched? Have you watched? I've not seen it. I, I'm just not interested in Apple, Apple TV Plus as a content channel right now. I mean, you have it for free, don't you? I, I do for the year, and it's probably going to run out soon because we're getting close <laughs> to September. But there's too much out there, and nothing 
I, I, like the interface is terrible on Apple TV to get to that those shows the way it it's is blended weird. in because it's you know, like the, in their TV app which contains yeah. everything else. It is very strange. I grant you that, but watch the first two or three episodes. See if you're hooked because it's it's really quite good. And I mean, the, like the 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 writing is probably some of the best parts of it. And uh, it's it'll remind you of Aaron Sorkin. So I was just about to ask: Is it Sorkin esque? in a way that will make me just want to rewatch the West Wing. And it's like, walk and talks. Mm -hmm. It is like it's banter back and forth. It's conservative and liberal viewpoints. It's definitely harkens to to West Wing, but it it's not West Wing. I mean, it, it's it's almost an unfair comparison given that they had so many successful seasons and this is a new show. But right. uh, you know, it's it's good. It's it's well cast too. It's like they it's not just like oh they found good actors. They found actors that worked well for these roles in a way that I think uses what you know of these actors going into it already. You know, you as the viewer, what do you think of Stephen Carell? From Stephen the Carell. Office. Who calls him Stephen Carell? Right, it's Steve Carell, <laughs> Mr. Carell Mr. from the office. Like I think you take that with you into this show in a way that's that's kind of interesting. Interesting. Okay, I'll give it a try. Definitely before my subscription lapses, or maybe they'll grant people another year, right? Be based on how numbers are looking. Yep. Anyway, uh, enough with the the catch up. Let's move on to. Oh, it's going to be for for those of you who keep tapping these things. It's going to be not only are we doing a dual cast reverse order this week. Everything's backwards and upside down. Thanks, Kishore, for not being here. Maybe he'll even pop in later. But we're all, as always, we start with our top story. Top story this week. We're just saying that not a ton of news and there will be some tech to talk about a lot of microsoft news but i wanted to for top story talk about something we completely did not talk about last week and it dropped last week and that was the release of star trek lower decks on cbs all access there's another reason to subscribe to cbs all access they're they're really hoping to get people on you had discovery you had uh, what, was, what was the other one? There's the spinoff. Uh, there's Picard, of course. He's in two coming. Uh, Discovery's going to have his own spinoff for Captain Pike. Uh, and now an animated Star Trek show. Of course, the second animated Star Trek show. But this one from one of the co-creators of uh, one of the creators or one of the, the, the people who participated in making of Rick and Morty. One of the co-creators, I believe, Solar Opposites, which I loved. That's the Hulu uh, animated show, and this is definitely a comedy. So, you watched most of the first episode. <laughs> I think we yeah. have to get that out of the way. It's only the first episode that's out, right? I, by the time this episode, this podcast comes out, there will be two. So it's one one drop a week, ten episodes for the first season. Uh, but yes, um, presumably people have only seen the first episode. I said, children, gather round, wife. Come hither, sit on the Family. couch. Yes. Let us watch this cartoon show together. And, uh, you know, some of us, we all come from various amounts of Star Trek interest. Um, you know, my 10-year-old daughter probably having the least of it. My, my son and I sharing Star Trek Next Gen. You know, we watched every episode. And my wife also enjoying, having enjoyed most of those Next Gens. Uh, we all were open-minded about it. Didn't care for it. Made it about, I'd say, two thirds through, and then decided. Well, I think we'd all rather watch something else. This is not Star Trek. This is a cartoon that is sort of using the Star Trek name in order to launch and have more numbers than a, than an unknown cartoon would have. See, I disagree. Great. I I, com I agree in the fact on paper you are right. It is not the traditional. It's the fact that it's a straight up comedy animated regardless of animated because you could think of the star trek animated series as being in a, a canonical next season it was written and voiced by you know written by the original writing team voiced by the original cast it is for all intents and purposes the the, the original the, the true follow-up to original series after that was canceled and the stories were written as such uh, this is not that this is lighthearted. it's definitely feels like something that would have been on a fox network or an animated you know animation uh animation domination you know alongside the simpsons or family guy or american dad uh and in today's world of comedy where you have bob's burgers and you have uh, Rick and Morty and Solar Opposites and things that can embrace high concept, faster paced comedy. It almost feels like a 30 rock uh, of comedy, that, that kind of 
speedy, uh, but, but tonally, you're right, not Star Trek. But I think thematically, character-wise, it's not just the backdrop. It's not Star Trek. It's not shallow in its, in its how embedded it is in the fabric of the Star Trek universe. But how can you say that from a character standpoint? Because like all they they do literal caricatures of all of the senior staff. Like they're just they are they are the cartoons, you know, in this cartoon universe. And and, and they don't they don't treat that with any respect or seriousness that we've come to that they have earned. And <laughs> if you look at the senior staff of the other ships when they were brought into next generation, those characters were often caricatures and mirror all you know alternate mirror images of the senior staff that we knew from you know next generation and ds9 you know it's it the, the federation's a big place and this is canonically in the post next gen world before picard mm. uh the name of the show is a direct reference to a season seven episode of next generation one of the best episodes called Lower Decks, as I'm sure you remember, as you binge the series recently. And it's, that's well-regarded. It's one of the best Next, genera- Next Generation episodes because it showed the B cast, the C cast. People, you know, it's the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern story of what, what does this ship full of uh, a thousand people and, and hundreds of crew, what do those people actually do in their day-to-day when they're not participating on away missions. Uh, and the very fact that, I'm not gonna go into heavy spoilers, but the very fact that this ship, the Cerritos, their mission is second contact and what it means for the Federation after the flagships get to establish first contact, what it means to follow up on that, that is a deepening of the mythology of Star Trek. And that's the fun, like the, 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 the imagining of the future of like the, all the bureaucracy that I love about, you know, dreaming up the this 24th century world universe this galaxy i am so envious of you that you enjoyed this and and i appreciate that you as as a much bigger star trek fan than i ever could possibly be that you are not cynical about this that you're looking at it with an open mind good on you i'm having a hard time doing that it is it does not seem it like uh, it if i feel like i love that episode of lower decks and i wanted to see that and I didn't care if it was real, you know, people or if it was in cartoon form. But unfortunately, I feel like they, they said, okay, it's going to be a cartoon. So it has to have this kind of, you know, Ren and Stimpy, like just like over the top no. goofiness to it. And, okay, you're right. It's goofy. Yeah. You know, the fact that they joke about how people use the holodeck. Uh, I, I would argue that the captain of the ship is not a caricature. That the only caricature really, really is the first officer. Uh, the the Riker type character, who I believe is voiced by Jerry O'Connell, uh, he's First Officer Ransom, and he definitely has the he takes all the and Riker was a parody himself, right? Like in the first the first seasons, it like the Riker as we perceive Riker in you know in meme form and in popular culture today, right? It's a, a lot of those characters were typecasts, you know what did what you know what counselor Troy did in the first couple seasons right like it's i think they acknowledge all of that i don't i agree it's not the full on parables that you get from star trek but there i think there's room for that later on for the show to to really dive into the themes of science fiction and exploit the potential of that type of futurism uh i like the characters i like all the characters so far, they feel like characters that I can, I'm looking forward to see, you know, they have their personality quirks and they have their relationships with the other cast that are to be revealed. Um, and I just like that it can be a show about the mundane tasks of being an ensign on a ship and the aspirations of being an officer. Like they tap in these things uh, about what it's like to be a crew member of a ship that it's fun for a fan to wonder about and think about it's like playing you know you play like star trek voyager elite force right i did that was, right and that was about being a red shirt grunt and you got to go on the way missions and you weren't part of the main cast and that was a wonderful part of fulfilling that fantasy of being on on voyager dude you that's not a fair comparison they took it seriously <laughs> like that was a serious 
epi- like well, that was a serious game. It it was yes, they put you in in the form of a red suit so that they wouldn't have to deal with all the red tape of having to deal with the bureaucracy of getting stories pushed through Paramount because like it involved a, a character that they own and care about. So that yeah, they put you in a quick three engine awesome first person shooter game but it was on an offshoot same thing by the way that that stern did with the jurassic park pinball machine fantastic idea great approach this is not that this is this is a goofy kids you know like comedy uh cartoon that is probably like this a lot of the star trek stuff for the age group that i think they're seem to be targeted it's kind of probably i don't know over their head it's it's a weird it's a weird combination of of style and Star Trek. Like it's not one that I would expect, and it it doesn't resonate with me out of the gate. I hope by the end of the season you feel better about it that you continue to feel as you do now. And yep. what happened with Picard doesn't happen to this show, which was that's, more of a disappointment. And and I think that that's a fair comparison because the expectations for Picard were so high. This idea of live action has the burden of being people to think live action is more canonical. Right. When you, what's, what's filmed on screen is what is written, and that is what only matters in the, in the, in the text, of the capital T text of that world. And animation, I think, can still have that power. Uh, the expectations are definitely lower, and maybe that's it. Also, I, I think in a world today, I just lighthearted is something I welcome more. And that the fact that it can live alongside Discovery, New Worlds, and Picard, uh, means that we're getting a lot more Star Trek on television, which is something I'm all for because they certainly are not getting their shit done uh, on the <laughs> yeah, big movies. screen. Well, yeah. So, which which of these like branches of film do you think would you most like to see? Would you like to see the continuation of um, of the JJ verse, like that cast, or do you want to see the Tarantino version? What do you want to see on the big screen next? Well, the Tarantino one was supposed to be with the cast of the JJ. Oh really? Uh, there, was, there was some news this week too that uh, some some leak. I, I think some offhand mention because it's not really moving forward. But the Tarantino take on Star Trek, which was going to be quote unquote grittier, and he didn't. He came up with the idea. The idea was that he was going to also direct it, but it was going to be written by someone else. And Tarantino liked the script, but it was going to be returned to the classic next generation or sorry original series episode where uh, they go into a world where there are '30s gangsters. A Piece of the Action was the name of the episode, season two, episode 17. And it's where Kirk and Spock go into a planet where everyone is basically, you know, they use the back lot where they were shooting mob movies or mob TV shows and put Kirk and Spock in pinstripe suits. Uh, and it was going to be that take on Star Trek, which a lot, of, a lot of fans, again, saw that as maybe too irreverent, even though it's canonical and there are a lot of opportunities for cultural relevance and poignant criticism of the world as science fiction does best in that storytelling but it's one of those if i'm paying to see star trek it's got to be in space and it's got to have phasers and i got to see aliens and i don't think that's always the case and in fact you probably do that better on an animated show than you could on a live action show just budget wise you didn't answer the question though i think the question is the answer is i would have loved to see uh, i think they they had like two directors tapped in one of them uh, was Noah Halley. He was going to do a, his take on the JJ verse continuation uh, after Lucy in the Sky. Le- a little less excited about that. Uh, but the thing that they had pitched at the release of Star Trek Beyond, they were like, we're going to get Chris Hemsworth back and, and do a Kirk meet Kirk's father story. I would have loved to see that. Okay. That would have been big budget enough. And, and certainly uh, the stakes, the emotional stakes would have been there. Anyway, uh, we ha- we'll have to get Kishore's thoughts later on. I don't know. We're not going to do a week-by-week recap of Lower Decks because it sounds like the appetite isn't there. But if the show is good, I will continue to champion it. And maybe that will convince you, Jeremy Williams, um, to one day pick it up again without family. I feel like the burden of trying to please the family also maybe soured your, your, uh, your take on the show. It's true. I, I did put myself out there. And you're right. I, I failed. Yeah. Well, that's that. Don't let personal disappointment ruin the ruin the show for everyone else, Jeremy. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to our next segment. The VR Minute Virtual Reality This Week. Oh, how many weeks away are we from Oculus Connect? Well, we don't know, no. do we? Yeah, that would be a, that would be good information to have. I, I keep yeah. waiting. 
like these weeks keep starting, which is typically when this kind of news is announced and like there are no announcements. They must have a plan. Very strange. I mentioned it this week, particularly because it is October 13th as you're listening to this and the date that was pushed out with that leaked Oculus Quest new version, that photo, that white Oculus Quest, uh, presumably that's what it's called. Uh, you know, they'll still have the Quest name on it. Uh, it said September 15th, and that is a, a month away. So you would think if they're going to do some type of virtual event, which we ho- expect them to, you know, they would announce it at least a month out. I know registration would probably not be required in the same way if they're going to do a virtual event. It's going to be broadcast to everyone. But I want to know the details. I mean, developers need to know about the kind of uh, sessions that they want to attend, right? How they can participate in Q and A's and, and um, how they do game demos. Like there's so many questions in the air for us covering this event on an annual basis and what it'll look like remotely. Uh, Like where is Medal of Honor? Where the heck is Medal of Honor? I can understand why specific, uh, you know, bullet points or keynote subjects might be sort of, you know, a little gray right now or written in pencil. But you would think that the actual date would be established. So that, that's the strange thing. Like they could announce when it's going to be. It may, it's the only reason that I can think of why they might postpone it is because they haven't established how they want to host the event. And like I keep coming back to your idea, which is like if they could launch Horizons and get everybody in there somehow, some sort of you know instance theater event where everyone can attend in a virtual environment, that'd be amazing. Maybe they just can't, like they'd like to get there. And they can't. That's the only thing that I that I can think of why there'd be a delay in any kind of announcement for the date. But yeah, you know, who knows? But there is, uh, while there is Oculus news, there's a bunch of PSVR news actually. Yeah. Uh, the first of which is Hitman Three that's coming out next year. It's going to be, of course, the final of the trilogy, the Hitman, the new Hitman trilogy, out on your PS4, PS5, Xbox One, presumably Xbox One, Xbox Series X, as well as PC. But uh, as shown off on Sony's State of Play, uh, the PS4 version and presumably PS5 version, which will support PSVR, will support VR. That's a long way of saying VR support for Hitman 3. Is that the entire game, though, or is it just like a few missions? I think it's not only is it the entire game, they said that if you have Hitman 2 and Hitman, you'll be able to import the data. If you own those on on PlayStation, you'll be able to replay those missions in VR as well. The entire trilogy playable in VR. That doesn't seem right. Like I could have met, like from a what not is- from not from a first person perspective. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of re-engineering of the game and rethinking how the gameplay works and camera control. And I mean, it's not you have to design a game from the ground up in order to get it right in VR usually. And uh, you know, I just the the clip that we see of the uh, of you taking the piano wire or whatever and then wrapping it around the guy's neck and everything i mean those mechanics those are animated typically and the way that all of those things collide and work well is because it's you know hand done to to allow the 6 degrees of freedom with each hand and like wrapping around other objects and colliding and everything that just seems, seems like an enormous task and i would think that you'd want to you know that you have to handle that from the ground up do a lot of extra work Porting it backwards to older games, that sounds like an impossible task. It's not the first time we've seen an older game uh, ported to VR. There was that, uh, what was that one? Well, there's that Skyrim, game. certainly, and other sure. instances. Yep. But- Fallout and uh, people have done. and uh, But there was that even like that, that co-op um, uh, cross-platform, like Cops and Robbers shoot 'em up the, he- the heist game, right? Uh, do you remember that one? Oh, yeah, the, the Rockstar one. Um, was it was it Rockstar? I don't think it was I don't the one with the Rockstar. facial facial animations, right? Case files. Oh no no no! I, I, that's L.A. Noir. L.A. Noir, right? But there was a yes, L.A. Noir was an, yet another one, but there was a multiplayer one that was adapted, very popular because it had co op and you could do VR and non VR cross play. Uh, so I think it's doable. I think you're right. It's going to be bootstrapped a little bit in some of the mechanics. You know, the porting motion to or a button animation to a motion uh if you got the characters rigged sure you can, you can see the hands and as you can see in the, the gameplay trailer you know hand movement is there it's not just head movement but 
Wait, so you're imagining you're tying a button to these actions? No, so no, you no have... I'm saying that what would normally have been a button, a scripted ah. animation, they have right. to map and make sure the interaction with NPCs, with objects in the world still work to trigger yeah. the, the, the state, right? Whether it's an assassination, whether it's the piano wire thing, whether it's activating a door, right? The, all of these things have, those are the mechanics that have to be ported over. But if they do it for their latest game, I can't see why it's not then easy to then retroactively get to work on the first two games. Uh, it, if it's I the mean, same engine and same scripting language and everything. It's done. Like to, 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 you break, there's, when you introduce VR into a game that wasn't designed for it, like not only do you have to deal with all of the motion sensitivity problems that the player might encounter, but you have all of these walls that are erected that the player could never break through. And now suddenly they can move through everything. They can push their head through things, put their hands through things, collide with things they weren't supposed to break physics engines, you know, break illusions. And um, like maybe some emergent things will arise from that. And that's interesting, but it's like actually making a playable game out of it. It sounds like a huge, like difficult task. I'll, I'm just amazed that even they could do like a Hitman game from the ground up at all like that. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, and I, I hope it'll be a huge success, but it just sounds like the back porch to older games sounds like a challenge. I can see it. It's not ideal, but I think at this point, it's the only way they're going to get those assets to work. You're not going to get a Hitman game of this scale built from the ground up VR only. And as and I think VR fans will be happy to adapt to this. And you got to give the VR users, especially the younger users, more credit. Payday 2 was the name of that game that was first released as a straight-up traditional PC game and console game, ported to VR, very popular, and people gave it uh, a lot of leeway for some of the comfort issues because you got to play this, you know, full-fledged console game in in headset, and just the added immersion uh, made it worth it. Um, another port, this time from mobile VR to well, console VR, is Vader Immortal, ILM X Lab, which uh, I know they're doing Tales from Galaxy's Edge, we talked about previously. Also did three episodes of Vader Immortal, and all three of those episodes will be released in uh, PSVR as of later this month. Is it August 25th? Is that right? Yeah, August 25th, uh, 30 bucks for all three. Yeah, I think the, the game was... The game, it's a game, we experience, story, whatever you want to call it, was interactions were simple enough that the motion wands would be suitable. And, you know, they, they feel like lightsabers. And I think if you don't have a quest and you have PSVR, worth picking up. What do you think is the story behind this, this, uh, this game being shared from Oculus to PlayStation? I, I mean, a lot of people think, well, it's a third-party game. Maybe Oculus contracted them, and gave, it was a timed exclusive deal. I think that's so, exactly it. I, I, I wonder about that though, because like, it's it's been on like it's been a while, and I wasn't expecting it to be anywhere else. I mean, certainly I've said before, like there's there's no difference between first party and third party if enough money is involved. And if they bought this game, if they basically like paid for this game, and and you know ILM you know, um, didn't get any royalties on the back end or they didn't get like any rights to the game, this is not up to, to ILM to, to make a deal with PlayStation. This would have been up to Oculus. So I wonder if it was and if this is in fact part of some sort of share between Sony and Oculus, uh, content share that could lead to, you know, other games that were exclusive to PlayStation coming to Oculus exclusive on the PC. Hope, hoping, I mean, you're talking about Tester's Effect being the example of the other way around. Something right. that's exclusive to the PSVR first, then going to Quest. I think in both these cases, you're looking, you're seeing something that probably, I think, isn't there. I think it's purely it's not- lawyers and logistics. Of, of timed exclusivity it's not exactly the same thing tetris effect went to epic first it was on pc and right. it, they epic bought the timed exclusive on pc and then it's going to come out on steam eventually if it yeah it hasn't already been announced but um this is like the first time that it's been anywhere else and it's not it's odd that it's going to sony i'm maybe i'm just excited to see more sony exclusives come to the pc in one form or another i mean it's a good point that why isn't this coming out on and I gotta check Vader Immortal is not out on PC VR, it's not on Steam, right? It's on right, right. it's on a regular Oculus, yeah. It's, it's just on Oculus, it's still, right. yeah. So it's going from one closed garden, walled to, garden another. to another walled garden, yeah. which that's the thing that raises 
eyebrows. Why not? If you're gonna, if you, if exclusivity period is over and you're gonna go to PSVR, you have the PC. You know, the compi- compile. You can just take off the Oculus guards and put it on Steam or Epic, right? Why? Hmm. Yeah, I That's mean, in terms of exclusivity, maybe you, it's it's a non compete. You well, maybe it's that. Maybe maybe Sony just was the highest bidder. Maybe that's just like ILM. I don't think saying, Sony paid that. Paid paid for this. I think this oh. is one hundred percent ILM wanting to reach a new market because they are a developer publisher and uh, their PSVR users are isolated from Quest users. And there's just well, another opportunity there. Why wouldn't they release everywhere else on PC then? I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's non compete. I don't think anybody wants to be on PlayStation VR from a development standpoint. Right, if you could, like, could be on Steam versus PSVR. I mean, honestly, like the, the the specs are so hard to work within, like in terms of like not only just the processing, but those controllers. I mean, this is this is a sixth off experience, and you know, Iron Man's the best we got, it, and uh, even they said it was hey, not. Blood and Truth is pretty good. I'm telling you, de- devs do not like working with move controllers. Um, you know, as great as that market is, it's a nice, huge market, but I would think that's why you go there because there's money involved. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we got to remember that move controllers weren't even essential to begin with, right? They were, they were, it was the connect of the PSVR accessory. Yeah. It was, uh, it was additional add on, on the add on. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe there's something there. I, I just, I, it just feels to me, it reads to me just like a standard time, it, you know, details in the nitpicking of the, the okay. contracts that allowed them. But makes me think. I would love, I would love for, I agree, I would love to see all the VR players bind together or, or, or you know, allow for more standardization of these times exclusives to be released because it's less about, it's more about building the whole user base as a whole right now um, and less about owning, owning the platforms. Kumbaya. Uh, last bit of uh, VR news, Enreal, which has their, their AR glasses, which I was able to test uh, earlier this year. Uh, they're finally launching in Korea, in South Korea, the Enreal Lights. So it's paired uh, with the launch of Samsung's Galaxy Note 20, and there's pricing. It will be uh, $590 equivalent um, if you buy it just as it's standalone. And real glasses. I believe this includes their um, their uh, the the puck, the processor puck. Uh, but if you want to buy it with a Galaxy Note twenty, then it'll be only about three hundred dollars. What are the phones that it, it's compatible with? I mean, definitely the Galaxy Note twenty. But I think it's a Qualcomm, basically newer Qualcomm chips uh, will work with it. Actually, hmm, with that pricing, I don't even know if that includes that will include the the processing unit probably not yeah because if if it's if you get the discounted price for buying it with the galaxy and you would presumably use that as the processor then you wouldn't be buying the processing unit itself huh that's yeah i mean there's still no plans or announced plans for it to come out in the states there's only the developer edition uh so they may still want to be building a bigger software catalog yeah, that's the problem. I mean, when Apple comes around and finally releases their glasses, they're not going to be pitching hardware. They're going to be pitching experiences. They're going to have software done that like shows you something that you want, and then you buy the hardware in order to get that. Like so far, it's just been a lot of cool hardware, you know, attempts that have come to market for developers, so the developers can make that killer app. And not, we haven't seen it yet. Chicken and egg, chicken and egg, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and using then real light, one of the things I say, like, they don't need every single application. You don't need app parity with what you would get on a smartphone, like maps, messaging, web browser. That's that's overkill. You know, even um, uh, uh, Magic Leap didn't have that. They had their their OS, and there are things you could do in that. You know, all I think you need really is a simple, streamlined way to transfer within reason. OBJ files, objects that you can, uh, 3D models that you can then project in front of you and then examine, right? If, if this is going to be a productivity tool for people designing on a flat screen to then want to experience it, you know, next you know, in, in, in physical space and a way to also do a mirror, a screen mirror from whether a phone or a laptop or some type of output, you know, HDMI output that then casts that image and maps it to some 
plane, you know, whether it's your wall, and have it fixed in space. So it's not moving as your head moves, it's locked in. So you can just say, my phone, I'm plugged into this, this, these glasses. I want whatever is playing on my phone, whether it's YouTube, full video, or just the OS web browser to be locked onto that wall or floating in front of me. I think that would be, that would be enough for me to want to use this on a semi-regular basis. Yeah, that is the jumping right to the regular basis, you know, kind of a, you know, use case. I, I wonder if there's going to be something intermediary. Be cool. I mean, I could imagine we, uh, we renovated our house five years ago. How amazing would it have been to be able to walk through the house while it was, you know, down to its studs and project various options, you know, walls, wall colors, furniture, shapes, you know, kitchens, like just in different configurations. That would be an incredible use for this kind of technology. I mean, you have that with all your IKEA apps and all your yeah. furniture, all your shopping apps, and the fact that people can do that holding a phone in front, right? And that's sufficient. You know, you don't need to spend five hundred to a thousand dollars on glasses to see it in your field of view when the thing that you already have and that the you know the mapping is built in to these phones, the good enough, right? Just from from a computer vision, uh, that's that's a hard sell. I disagree, actually. I, I think it would be different to see it in stereo and at, in live six off while you can move your head around. No doubt like, different. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that there, that there might be a sort of a VR versus flat screen experience difference there. Um, but, you know, who, who knows? I, I just wonder, I just, I'm, I'm as curious as anybody about how AR is going to capture the, the market's uh, imagination. All right. Um, well, I think that's it. Anything else from, oh, uh, one thing I want to quickly mention. Yeah, we have time for it. What's time for it? Uh, I've been testing uh, something <laughs> completely weird but i'm gonna mention it in the vr minute and they are shoes i'm gonna show them (laughs) to you okay these are shoes all right all right let's see them these are a pair of drop labs they're from a spinoff from the people who did the beats headphones and uh they are haptic feedback shoes no what are you talking about so they have like the reason I found out about these is because I've been doing uh, a bunch of uh, transducer work. So I have like installed on my chair, uh, the, the butt kicker transducer, which takes the low end, pass through for an audio, you split it off from whatever movie you're playing or even a VR headset, right? And then you can feel in the chair, the, the bass, like it's basically a really strong bass localized to your butt. It gives you the 4D experience that you would get in a theater but at home and something you can definitely incorporate not only in your living room, but also maybe in a, a cockpit for games like Star Wars Squadrons coming out. I feel like yes. that would be pretty impressive or Flight Simulator, right? Feel the rumbling of a jet because a lot of times that low end that you get from the audio, if it's mixed well enough, um, can simulate the kind of rumbling that you want to feel in those games. Quick question uh, about that. Are, are there any games that actually have like a transducer channel that is only for that? No, but there's softwares and there's even free software that you can get that basically allows you to take that low end and they know specifically for racing games uh, that low end is, is mapped to things like the rustling on the grass versus pavement. Huh. It's a different type of sound and you can tune that the frequencies, you can tune the cutoffs uh, so that you actually feel it more, less of audio and more of it just for the, hmm. the, the the feedback the transducer feedback so okay. it's still a hack it's not a you know the, the point one channel isn't just for haptics it'd be great but then if it was but that requires a whole level of you know mixing that's mm-hmm. not there right it's all analog this is analog to the tactile the physical um one of your favorite things right it's why the 3.5 millimeter jack is so useful uh this is the same thing bluetooth connection or a wired connection made for music so the idea is that you know bluetooth from your phone to the shoes, then from your shoes to your headphones, your Bluetooth headphones, and you're listening to, let's say Hamilton, you get to feel the bass in your feet. <laughs> it doesn't go all the way through your body. It's not like having, you know, going to a concert and having these giant, you know, megawatt speakers that are rumbling your, your heart, but you do feel as if you're standing. You know, <laughs> Danica called it, like, you sound like a bad neighbor. <laughs> you know how like your neighbors are playing the bass really loud when they're watching yeah. a movie or listening to music. It's like it feels like it feels like you're a bad neighbor. Like I'm walking around the house, oh, right, okay. and then she yeah. hears it on my feet as if like 
what is that low end? What is that bass? Let's move it around. Wait, she hears it? Yeah, well, if I have hardwood floors. And so, yeah, definitely like through the floors huh. too. If, if I'm on the, like a floor above and on hardwood floors, you can hear it on a floor below like, you know, someone was blasting their subwoofers, you know, living above you. But they're tiny little drivers. I mean, where- That's the thing. So where they're, are the drivers and like how, how big is it? Is it about that big? It's about this big. That's why it's, it's thick. They had to make their own transducers. They're, I think the, the, the physical profile of this is what like limits you know, how powerful these can be. Obviously, there's a battery in here. So there's all these kind of like design constraints for making these wearable. You know, They're heavier than normal shoes. Um, I'm not wearing them outside yet because I don't want to get them dirty, but you know, right now in the house. But yeah, music's one use case, doing a bunch of that. But gaming is their other use case. Yeah. Um, so- before we talk about VR, console gaming, um, it works over like a uh, connection. Like if you have your Xbox and you plug in the 3.5 millimeter jack in your Xbox controller, like can directly tie to the shoe. So I play Red Dead Redemption. It's fascinating. Like on, you're on a horse and you're galloping, you <laughs> feel the hooves <laughs> as if you're on the horse and they're hitting the bottom of your shoes as you're running through the world. Really? Uh, same as you're, if you're like wading into a lake or a stream. And the water is rushing. Apparently, there's enough low end, right? That uh, you know, enough that the low pass filter gets it, so you feel a little bit of that kind of tingling sensation um, of you know what it would be like if you were stepping into you know in, into a little bit of water. Your Have, feet aren't getting I wet. assume you've tried it with a VR app. Yes. So I did it with Beat Saber and Pistol Whip, and I will be doing this with racing games, which is my most interesting uh, use case of this. But Beat Saber works really well. It's direct line connection, not Bluetooth. So there's no latency problems and you feel the beats. It's just like, it's an added part of the experience I didn't know I wanted, but after not doing it, it's like, oh man, I could really use more bass in this game, especially with the, the Quest headphones, right? Like if the audio isn't already, isn't that great. And I did it with the um, Dux Audio Head Strap and having okay bass in that, but then, and then it being a full body haptic you know from foot to head that was that increased the immersion that's wild man i mean i i always was fascinated by just how much basic rumble delivered to video games when we got like the rumble pack for the gamecube for the uh n64 yeah you know like and since then like that has been enough for like over a decade yeah. and it's it's like I, I doesn't surprise me that this makes a difference to your gaming. It's just funny. It's just, you got to admit, like you're putting rumble shoes on in order to play Beat Saber. That's funny, and it <laughs> makes me want like the haptic engine feedback. You know, the kind of very precise HD haptics that you get on the Joy Cons, yeah. you get on your phone, and what you're going to get on the PS5 controllers. Like I want localized because you think of it as almost like the resolution of the haptics. Right, right now the resolutions pretty low in terms of um not the temp like the frequencies are fine responsive is fine in terms of how quickly and how responsive it is but it's only in one spot and so you can't pinpoint you know feel something on the tip of your toes versus the heel it's kind of localized just in the center because that's the way they had to design it i could see this in the future having you know maybe three spots and i'm sure they've done studies of like how many do you need for it to feel having a meaningful effect i'd love to see like that research um but racing games, right? If you're going to do a VR racing game and you have a transducer in your seat you, and you have feedback on your, let's say your, your wheel, right? You don't have feedback on your pedals. I wonder, and I haven't done this yet, will this give you enough of the feedback on your feet to feel, to increase that immersion of, of driving? No. You don't think so? No. <laughs> No, I don't. I don't know. I've I've looked into wheels. It seems like what people care about most. It's interesting you say that because people consistently say it's not the wheel, it's the pedals. Like that's where you actually get that that sensation of actually feeling where that resistance is with the brake, especially. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, well, no, getting... you want you want to get that with your pedal anyway, right? You want to have the yeah. pedal. You want to have good pedals. I'm saying like what you don't get even with good pedals is the ambient sensations of right. a car rumbling of a x-wing cockpit presumably rumbling and even if i have the transducer on my seat that's like my points of contact to the cockpit are my butt and my feet 
And if I have the rumble on on the butt, why not have the rumble on the feet as well? Do it, dude. Make it feel like you're even more immersed. Get that new Logitech uh, steering wheel with rumble in the in the wheel. <laughs> and yeah, you got like four points of rumble. It's gonna be great. Right, right. No gloves needed. Right. It's the haptic feedback gloves, but for your feet. Anyway, more testing required. Uh, and just want to give a preview of that. Um, let's move on quickly because we are running a little bit low on time. But let's head over two did i queue it up i did not queue it up our next segment A lot of Microsoft news this week. I'm going to run through it relatively quickly. You know, last week we uh, were just on the heels of the announcement that uh, the xCloud service will be coming to Android, um, and we wondered why not iOS, and it became a whole big thing. Uh, Apple had to make a statement. You know, it turns out it's this whole policy and walled garden aspect of it all where Apple thinks having games on, uh, on iOS, if they can't individually review each game like they do with discrete applications uh, on a service like this, they will not allow that service, which seems like an arbitrary distinction when you have subscription services that allow things like other pieces of content, like books and, and movies that they allow that they don't absolutely review each of those pieces of content. It feels like this is to protect their arcade. Well, yeah, and revenue streams. Uh, and you know, they do allow you to have an app like Steam Link as long as the app only streams content that is on your local area network already. So you can play games that are on a local console, but you can't play games from the cloud. That's the distinction that they make in their TOS. It seems completely arbitrary. Yeah. And I'm sure if Microsoft wanted to pick a fight with Apple about this, uh, they would not necessarily be in the wrong and it could bring up matters of antitrust. It's just so backwards. It's just so, it's like, you know what? It's not backwards, unfortunately. Like the backwards way to do it would be to treat the phone like a PC that's an open platform that anybody can develop for and anybody can release whatever they want on. And Apple sells the platform and anybody can do what they want with it. You backwards like, being a good thing. Yes. Like that is like, that's the PC. That is what the PC has been. That's what the Apple II was. That's, that's still what the Mac is, although they'd like to make it a closed, you know, walled garden with their app store. Um, but the phone is definitely that. It is like a walled garden and we live in Apple's world and so do all the developers, even Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's rather unfortunate. Um, I hope they figure it out and come to terms, but it doesn't look like that will. And, you know, cloud gaming is, isn't going to go away and Apple hasn't make, made any moves on that. You know, their, their arcade play, well, I'm sure it did well in the first few months, uh, seems to have petered off because it's not easy being a uh, managing public re publisher relations and they don't have hardware right now that attracts the same type of gamers that people would go to an Xbox for or go to a PC for, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, more on the Microsoft side, of course, the Xbox Series X now, uh, not just coming out this year, but November, it's been identified. So yeah, how much will it be? Don't know. Yeah. Still not, still not announced. Don't know how much it'll be. I think they're still playing that uh, game of chicken with Sony. You saw um, Mike's tweet? No, what was it? What was it? That's what he said. He said, has there ever been a game of chicken like this before uh, in, in game console history? And uh, you know, no one can think of a time. Microsoft is so flush right now that they could absolutely pull a power move and undercut Sony's, like Sony did with PS4 versus Xbox One. I know the P&Ls, the, the budgets aren't the same and Microsoft can't just say because we're worth over a trillion dollars and our stock is doing wonderfully, you know, hey, my, uh, Xbox division, you can afford to not make as much money. They need to, to keep that, that part of the business growing. But if they really wanted to, I mean, it matters. Like it, this will, the pricing, because it's a game of chicken, that tells you how important it is. And gamers know when we're talking about several hundreds of dollars, to invest in a console in addition to $60 plus games, that $50 difference, $100 difference in the console prices matters a lot. And you got to think about, Microsoft must be doing the math about their supply chain right now, whether they can have enough units. And if they undercut the pricing, then they potentially have supply shortages and that's not going to be great for their launch. You know, matching 
supply and demand plus the perception of high pricing and the the whole history of bad pricing on Xbox, like all of that is weighing on them. Uh, that is to say, I'm sure they've they're going to announce it. They have to announce it sometime soon because people got to do pre-orders, right? They got to figure right. out how many people are buying. That's right. And they uh, got to get that Halo Infinite out this year on, at launch time. Oh, Jeremy, not coming out this year. <laughs> it's not coming out this year. Halo Infinite pushed to 2021. Good news? Probably. Well, I, you know, hey, it's like Miyamoto says, you know, a, a game released too early is always bad. A game delayed is potentially good. <laughs> so it's funny because on... The PC side, one of the distinguishing factors is you have early access being a widely acceptable part of the culture where you can have a game that isn't done, quote unquote, for years and you can still charge 40 to $60 for that because people want to play it and they can accept the faults of it on a computer, but they will not accept that a game is ever evolving, even though that's still the case with patches and updates and content releases on the console side in the same way. Really? I wouldn't have expected that. I'm not a real console gamer these days, though. I mean, th- that's, I think, part of the reason why this has been delayed. Some of the reception, presumably, people on the internet not liking what they saw at the, the game showcase. And also, of course, working from home these past couple months, I'm sure, has inhibited their ability to collaborate, uh, this massive team at 343, to, to make this game. Um, so anyway, they will not have it at launch. And so, you know, it really looks like those first party exclusives, it's stronger on the PS5 side than it is on the Series X. Uh, speaking of pricing, there was a leak from a controller image of what looks to be an Xbox Series S. So we already know on the Sony side, there's going to be two PlayStation 5s, one with HD Blu-ray with the disc support, one without disc support. Uh, and presumably this will be similar on the Microsoft side. There'll be a more affordable version of the Series X called the Series S. So as opposed to the Xbox One S coming out years later, this will just be available at launch. That's the edition. Yep. Last bit of Microsoft news. Remember the Surface Duo? Uh, yeah, that, that was the super expensive uh, two-screen tablet phone. Is it a phone? Phone, laptop. It yeah. was going to be the ultimate, you know, Use it on the subway, use it on your airplanes, hybrid between, you know, the, the dream of the Microsoft courier. Uh, obviously, they'd have to, they had to change things up quite a bit with lockdown and people working from home. And now it's no longer a device to be sold for people who are commuting uh, a lot. It's devices so you can take a break from your desktop computer and still have the functionality to access your PDFs and your Microsoft Word uh, when you're at the park or something or on the couch. Uh, But it will come out on September 10th. That came up so soon for $1,400. It's less than a month away. It's Android, of course, uh, and this kind of ties in the Microsoft building Android, full Android support in the Windows. You can basically run Android apps on the newest version uh, or preview version of Windows. Pre-order is available on Best Buy, uh, Microsoft Store, and AT&T, uh, but it is expensive. 5.6-inch OLED, 4x3 uh, four, four aspect ratio divided into two. Um, actually, sorry, 4x3 aspect ratio connect two 4x3 aspect ratio screens come together for a 3x2 aspect ratio, more boxy screen. What was the uh, phone? That Was it a Samsung phone? Was it the Galaxy Fold? Yeah. That, that it, it had issues with like the thing people thought it was a peeled away material they had to fix that but that was yeah. wasn't that wasn't that more expensive wasn't that like two thousand dollars i think so and and you know the, the Motor, motorola had version and the fold two obviously uh they announced in the the z flip you know the the bendable oleds this is not foldable oleds this is yeah. a straight up seam um and with stylus support um I think a lot of questions will be how well integrated is Android into this and how, how much does that fade into the background and their first party app experiences? How, how smooth is that? Uh, I really want to use one. Yeah. I really can't imagine a scenario without travel, ha- being able to choose that over like a laptop that I would travel with. Uh, but I'm really curious about it. I'm not going to buy one, $1,400, way too expensive. Um, but maybe we'll reach out to Microsoft and see if they'll be interested in sending one. For review. Last bit of the tech, Ampere, NVIDIA graphics cards, probably going to be announced September 1st. That That's was right, right. All right. That's like three weeks away. 
three weeks away, 3000 series. There have been leak benchmarks already. Uh, we won't go over those, but uh, the, the last, the 2000 series did very well. And they, this is them trying to take things back over uh, with AMD being very aggressive on the pricing on the Radeon side. So I can't wait to see what this have. My big question, will it have the display link port, the USB-C port that the, the 1080s had and the founder's editions had that the new ones don't? It, right? It, so what, VR port. Yeah, so that would be like the one port to rule them all? Yes, that would presumably allow and the standard of USB-C, but video over USB-C, uh, all the bandwidth of display port, uh, that would plug into a next-gen VR headset. Not data in the same way that you do Oculus Quest, but actual video. Right. So, but you wouldn't, so but currently, even with the latest headsets, you need a display port plus a USB. This would be a single cable. Yes, a single okay. cable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be yeah. cool. I mean, I'm, I'm curious about these new cards. My feeling about the 20 series was that it brought RTX, it brought the ray tracing, real-time ray tracing, which was, you know, incredible if the game supported it. But otherwise, the benchmarks didn't seem terribly improved over the 10 series I'm it was curious. just like a shift up slightly and you know yeah. the pricing you know your your 2070 was as fast as your 1080 that kind of right. thing. right yeah yeah so i'll be curious to see if it's the same thing this time around or if they if it they sort of get a massive improvement across the board i think that's the idea that's supposed to be a massive improvement plus rtx you know quake 2 and rtx a lot of fun <laughs> most of those time of day stuff it's it totally is i don't know if I you've have, been doing it no i haven't i i uh, I, I should try it Boot it up, Quake Two. Oh, yeah. Like it's a game that I'm sure you've played. You played a ton of, and yep. you like you know those levels, and you can pause the menu, change time of day, change the shadows. You know, it's a lot of cool kind of um, photography effects you can put in, um, all in real time. It's very nice. Um, Braid Anniversary Edition is coming out. I want to give that a shout out. That was one of the best games of two generations ago. Um, <laughs> That thing that, that undersells it. It's the best, one of the best games of all time. It is. It is absolutely one of the best puzzle games of all time. Uh, Jonathan Blow, of course, David Hellman. Uh, the art has been redone by David Hellman to to make it look better. You know, the game in my mind looks so good. The art style is so distinct that I struggle to imagine like what will it look like. Like, will it actually be that meaningful? Maybe just it's sharper, or higher res. Um, this isn't but, uh, a resampling of the original assets. They went back and repainted everything. So it, yeah. they've, they've done it right. Like they went back and now there's actually additional effects so that um, it looks like some of the brush strokes are actually animating constantly. And they redid a lot of the artwork so that it just is in a more beautiful art style um, as well as being higher resolution and you know more complicated in terms of what they can do with the faster processors. But I think more importantly for me is... Uh, Obviously, I, I do want to play the game again. I haven't played it since it came out. And That's I, I'm, the thing. I'm sure it will all be fresh again, which is going to be a wonderful <laughs> yes. thing. It seems um, like the right amount of time where you forgot the solutions to the puzzles. Right, but exactly. You have that like in the back of your head, like, oh, I'm like triggering the same thought processes that I went through, the same emotional difficulties I went through to get through the game the first time, but now we're older. But you, you got to understand if you didn't play this game, this is a designer's game. Like this is a game designer's game, like not, which is to say, like if you are a game designer, you love this because of the innovation that, th that they put into, that Jonathan Blow put into the puzzle design and the, the game design. It, it did things with old, you know, uh, you know things that, that had never been done before. And so it made you think outside the box. And what they've done is they've added a commentary layer to the new, to the new game, which they're saying is the best commentary, in-game commentary experience that anyone's ever accomplished in a video game. So I can't wait to see that and to delve into all of the how it was made, what were the thought processes, give me the developer's notes aspect of these things. That's super, super interesting. Um... I had some TV news. Uh, ah, let's talk about TVs in the future time. That was a, more of a, a time filler. Uh, we're not doing science, uh, unfortunately. Kishore is not here. There was a small chance he was going to pop in. Uh, uh, we got, I got to ask you, you, you were going to talk about the transparent OLED TV. Yep. How are they doing that? How? Because I can understand how if like black were transparent and anything that got white or, or was colorful became more and more opaque. And then like maybe like solid white is like fully opaque and everything else would have to be kind of in between but how like their images show opaque black i think the images are probably not representative of what the tv looks like in person and I really think you lose i think in full transparent mode it's probably not as transparent as you think you probably see through it yes but you know there could be up close a screen door type effect or you know it could look like uh you know an nd filter 
a tin thing of it. The, their images really would require an alpha channel in the video signal. And video signals don't have that. Like, HD, like standard video signals well, are strictly it, RGB. It, and this is not transparent as you watch the content. It's transparent when you turn the TV off. Not according to some of the demo no. stuff. That's what I'm saying. Like that, you can see through the parts around the butterfly that are not uh, colored in. So it must be then uh, like a, a pass filter, right? They they in their processing say anything that's supposed to be white or black image processing frame by frame. You know, you cut off this point <laughs> and make it transparent, um, so that you and then you probably see some speckling in the gradients, right? This is what that's I'm saying, man. Noticeable. Like this is what they've uh, what they're pitching here. It does not seem possible in terms of like current video standards. So I'm just saying, like I want to see this in person. How is it being done? Like even like if you go to this uh, to the Verge article that you link to, there's a what is it a, a panther? Uh, there's a there's a, some sort of wild cat on the TV and perfectly opaque. It's a black cat, and yet around it you can see through it to the environment. So I want to see. I want to know what they're doing. If this is just smoke and mirrors advertising. It, they're, apparently, they're not bringing it to the U.S., so it's going to be really hard for me to see it. <laughs> this is why CES was fun and interesting, and there will be no CES in person next year. So it, it may be years. I'm sure you know, someone over um, is in Korea or uh, in Taiwan will be able to shoot some store, in-store video of it and want we'll to watch it on YouTube, I guess. All right, let's move on to our next segment. Oh, it's not technology. We're doing uh, pop culture. Speaking of canceled events, New York Comic Con, unfortunately, they had to make their announcement. I think everyone expected it. It will be not in person this year. They're doing a virtual version. No meetups at the Javits Center this October. Um, thanks, COVID. Thanks, America. Uh, but the news still is coming. Movies are still being made. Pre- a lot of pre-production for a lot of things, including Tron the Third. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, Garth Davis directing? <laughs> okay. I mean, I'll be there. I'll be there. This is fantastic. Uh, I have no idea what to expect. I did not see Lion, but now I want to. It's so, not a science fiction film. It's a drama. Yeah, it's, I know. But it was like up. extremely well-received. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I, you know, interesting. Apparently, like the thing that's most intriguing to me is apparently he was pursuing this. Like he was after this project and then finally the executives after months of convincing they gave in so apparently he really wants it it's not like you know he he could care less about it so i'm excited he's the right age he'll be turning 46 this year which is just right for having seen trying in the theater when you were you know a a teen a young teen and uh that's exciting i I glad i can't wait to see what uh, fresh mind brings to it um the question is will they continue the storyline who cares People what? go to nobody cares. Okay, look, I shouldn't say that because clearly people care. You care about lower decks, so I th- <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's the, the most amount of shade that Jeremy's dropped ever on this podcast. I, so casually, I think people go to see Tron for the aesthetics. They go to see Tron because it is a different thing where like people go into computers. Mm. That's all people want. People want to see the neon, you know, aesthetic. And uh, so you're cool. saying. It could be an anthology type series where it doesn't, you know, the world that that was created, that Flynn created, is just exists now and doesn't need to be tied to Tron Legacy or the legacy of those characters. It's oh, just- I would absolutely, absolutely. I, I think people go for you could it could be a, a foreign language film and people wouldn't care. It's just like you go to see like what happens and what it looks like. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if people are really tied to the characters so much as they are to the aesthetic and just like the 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 vibe huh and the rules of the the visual language right and and the and not just the visual language but the rules of the 80s interpretation of what it meant for a digitization of a human right because you've seen the matrix right it can't be the matrix where it's like you know you're uploading your brain it can't be the singularity essentially it needs to be this kind of abstracted, you know, a bit is a character or programs 
aren't replicatable in the same way. You know, they are individual personalities, which doesn't really work with the way we understand software, but the way it was told through Tron and Tron Legacy, those are the kind of rules of Tron. I guess so, but it's it's really about like video games are actually life and death. Like that it's that aspect of Ender's game and and Ready Player One that you know Tron did um that is like it stands the test of time and now and nowadays with so many people now embracing video games like I think it it could appeal to a, an even greater audience um you know just people and even even like the Jumanji films which by the way are fantastic we had no idea I finally watched them with our family over the past couple of weeks like they're great they're surprisingly good and uh it, it that again is just like taking video games more seriously and this is an extension of that I think you've tapped into exactly why Disney wanted to greenlight this. They saw the success of Jumanji where, again, they took something that people had a lot of fondness for but didn't need to continue that story, uh, and they modernized it in a way that's relevant to gamers who understand you know, video game culture and the rules of video games, and it was a massive success. Not to say that Tron's going to be a comedy or starring The Rock or Kevin Hart. And in this case, it's going to potentially be Jared Leto, uh, but... It can, it can be, it can, it's a story that can be modernized with, like you said, those stakes of programs and games being, you know, life and death. Although we had that kind of also Ready Player One, you know, maybe, maybe those have a shared DNA. A uh, couple trailers out. HBO Max is a trailer for a show called Raised by Wolves. This is Ridley Scott directed and produced. I don't know if you got a chance to watch the trailer. Very moody, atmospheric, scary. I'm, I'm interested in watching this. Uh, this is a, uh, a parable in which, uh, in, a, in a future humanity uh, cataclysm from a great war, and a- androids raise children, uh, but the androids may be evil, or there's some unknown force on this off-world planet. Huh. It looks very much stylistically like a Ridley Scott thing in the vein of uh, Alien Covenant. Oh, wow, this Mephius. looks expensive. Yeah, and HBO has spent a lot of money on this. Uh, what unfortunately does not look expensive, Netflix has a new space show called Away. It's from the creator of Friday Night Lights. It's about, it's starring Hillary Swank, about uh, the first crewed mission to Mars, three-year mission. And while ostensibly it's going to be about that, it is more, I think, about the human drama. It feels more like an ABC family, ABC TV show, about the, the, the toll, the emotional and the human toll of the, the crew of astronauts uh, international crew of astronauts and being separated from their families and what happens on Earth in the three years. So a little bit different flavor than uh, Apple's For All Mankind, but another space show. On Netflix. No, I don't think there's probably going to be a single laser beam in this one. No. no. I need some laser beams in my sci-fi. Uh, it, it's like hard sci-fi. It's, it, or, you know, it's, it's dramatic sci-fi. Sci-fi is just the backdrop. In the same way that comedy, sci-fi is the backdrop for the comedy of Lower Decks, Jeremy. Okay. Um, a new announcement, uh, One Perfect Shot. you follow this Twitter account? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's interesting because I think there's just some guy who likes movies that does a Twitter account, and now it's being spun off into a major series. Well, it got spun off into a big website. It's a massive website now that, that reviews movies. They do uh, essays oh, about I didn't filmmaking. Know that. Uh, and so it started off just as you know, a small team of people, one guy just doing a Twitter account, just screen caps, literally screen captures of beautiful stills from films that people resonated with and, and submitted, you know, made their submissions to, uh, got a lot of followers. Now they you know, really dive into the art of cinematography. And Ava DuVernay, who, the director who did um uh selma. selma as well as um uh wrinkle in time and doing new gods for dc uh she's gonna be producing a tv show based on this twitter account and website that isn't just talking about individual shots and in films but apparently will find a way to enter those shots and critically examine the cinematography of those scenes they're talking about 360 degree renderings of these shots so which leads me to think they're going to be taking like it, it I, it'll be different people every week. Like they'll have famous directors come on and talk about their favorite shots, right? And the, so they must they'll probably give the directors or the producers, you know, a few months heads up on the shot they want to do, that then has to be imported into some sort of CAD program and modeled so that they can stand inside of it and move around within it and see shots, see aspects of that shot that maybe weren't even visible to the camera. I mean, that, that's really interesting to me. And you, you, we've seen, you know, annotations on shots like this. Vanity Fair is a great 
series on YouTube where they get directors and director of photography to analyze shots from film. They talk about what's behind the frame, behind the camera, and where the lighting is, and the situation on the day of. Really first-person accounts of the making of those iconic scenes. Uh, this feels like an opportunity to use technology like in The Mandalorian, the volume, right, where they can engulf a person in a representation of the set that day oh. uh, as opposed to physically building a set you know in augmented reality you can actually have it rendered in real time in a physical space that would because you can light it with that lighting so you're right? talking about like having giant screens that surround the people the the stars of the show that they could then like turn that the camera could then move around and so essentially it wouldn't be a 3d representation but it would sort of almost look like it I don't know how they're doing it. I'm just imagining that this is one way you could do it. If it's a 3D yeah. representation, then you've got to do some mixed reality, right? How are you going to put the host or put these cinematographers in the space to point out things and interact, right? Otherwise, it's just the 3D model turnaround that you get a voiceover. That's not a problem these days. Like Neil deGrasse Tyson does it all the time on Cosmos. You just, you, you just step into a virtual environment, green screen it, figure it out. It also sounds a lot like what Will's doing with the food show, except for movies as opposed to video games, right? Yeah. Recreating locations, virtual environment, in a virtual environment, um, and having and being able to provide commentary over it. Anyway, I'm looking very forward to it. I'm a fan of that Twitter account and the website. So great for them. Great concept. Last two bits. Uh, Alamo Draft House in Austin, the theater chain, is going to start offering private theater rentals. Now, of a back catalog of films, they've listed out 40 films, some classics, some relatively modern ones like Wonder Woman, uh, but $150 will let you and 29 other friends, up to 30 people, take up the theater to watch a movie, and you have to spend about $150 also in snacks, so it's about $300 all in, $10 a person, but a space, a, a safe, contained uh, theatrical view experience. I think it's a great idea. It's actually a good deal. Like in terms of a movie ticket, you know, 10 bucks plus food. I mean, that, that's a good idea. So if you have 29 friends and you want to get a movie theater together and go watch something, I, I would imagine that 30 people is the like sanctioned limit for you know, sheltering in place and, and gatherings in the cities where this is opening. And it's only opening in two cities right now. I um, hope they expand it. We have Alamo Draft House in San Francisco. One yeah. thing I don't like though, is because this is supposed to be an extended like living room type experience. They're allowing people to use, you know, do whatever you want. You can use your phone, you dude. Be on your phone, it's a if private gonna, party. Sure, but if I'm going to the Alamo Draft House for the Alamo Draft House experience, I want them to enforce their policies. No dude, phones. You have got to be kidding me. The Alamo Draft yeah. House is a freaking sham. They project this this image of they are so they have so much respect for the film that they couldn't possibly allow anybody to talk or, or use their phone during the, the, the actual movie. And then they proceed to walk around the entire theater throughout bringing people French fries and drinks and taking orders and turning on lights so that people can read the menu. It's, Oh, come on. Oftentimes it is the most during the climax of a film. Hypocritical uh, uh, policy that I have ever seen in, in theaters, and I, I do not approve. Let's file this under things that annoy you. Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bring that segment back in the future. Uh, and if you're up in Washington, I want to say, uh, or is it or uh, Oregon, uh, where the last standing blockbuster is still in operation as a private video rental business, just using the name Blockbuster. You also have an opportunity in September to rent it for a slumber party as a sleepover. This is a weird- Inside the Blockbuster. It's a weird promotion. It's not an ongoing thing they're going to do, but uh, they've set up a little bedroom in the middle of the Blockbuster <laughs> where you could have a slumber party. Uh, and uh, as of uh, August 17th, 1 p.m., reservations will go up and you can reserve for either September 18th, 19th, or 20th. This is in Bend, Oregon. And only residents of that county, you have to prove you're a resident of that county, are able to make a reservation. Oh, I didn't know that. I like that aspect of it then. It actually, it actually they're not, it's not a money grab necessarily then. It's not, it's not an auction either. Like they clearly have set the price on this. So that's cool. I'm glad that those, because it is a, neat component of that town it, i mean you have quite a movie selection do you sleep that night do you just no. binge, binge watch all night long <laughs> no. 
I've made a reservation at the uh, the Blockbuster. I just need to get to bed. Uh, what what are these movies? <laughs> no, no, you stay up all night. In fact, I would sleep heavily the day before so that I could make the most out of staying up all night and and swapping out VHSs and getting pizza. Yes, it, it's a it's a it's actually it's an LBE. It's a location based experience in a Blockbuster. I was that's funny. Because I was actually assuming that you get, you turn in at midnight and you turn the lights off. And you, you tuck no, in. You're, you're showing your age, Jeremy. Enjoy the sofa bed. <laughs> Enjoy the sofa. <laughs> that's that's a different type of uh, experience you wanna you wanna replicate. Sleeping on the sofa. All right, that does it for the podcast this week. Sorry, we have no uh, moment of science. Kishore will be back next week, uh, as we as well. But we do have a new outro. For y'all this week jeremy anything uh to promote anything you want to give a shout out to before we wrap it up uh no no just watch jumanji guys you know it's uh not half bad not half bad it, the acting is uh, pretty extraordinary uh i i agree with the acting especially in the second one yeah danny devito morgan morgan uh it's Don, Don, the danny devito and danny glover morgan freeman danny glover uh both are well represented in in the film Yep. Uh, by all the cast. Um, and I will say, watch Lower Decks. You know, re-up your CBS All Access just for a trial, just to, just to give, give, it, give it two episodes, give it three episodes. Maybe, maybe re-up in, a, get your free month um, or free week, uh, re-up in a couple weeks and give it a try. I will even go as far as to say, it's good. It's not just not bad. I'd say it's good. All right, uh, that does it for us. This out- week's outro comes courtesy of Black Powder Engine. He's back. Thank you so much. Let's take a listen. Hi there. I didn't see you. Passed it. Netflix is going to start letting people watch their content faster or slower (laughs) with playback control. If there's an editor like that involved and a director and a lot of people who have painstakingly chosen this pace, I want that pace. Jeremy, have you ever watched a tested video sped up? Because there are editors involved. I can't say, I don't think I actually have, Kishore. <laughs> yeah, I'm, like, I'm not sure I haven't watched a tested video sped up in recent times. Time, time. I saw that coming and that was fantastic. Well done. Welcome return. Thank you for making an outro. Uh, Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.